before I get started, just know that we are all here, my colleagues and I, the, the library, to help. We want to see students succeed, and it is our pleasure to help out with today's presentation on critical thinking. Any questions you may have, feel free to use the chat. I will pause a couple times during the presentation to entertain any questions or comments. And then, of course, at the end. And lastly, uh, this will be recorded. So there may be some slides that uh, you may be interested in and would want to write down all the information that's on there. And, and you may not have that chance to copy it all, but don't worry. This will be recorded and made available for everyone to review. And that way you can uh, take your time reviewing the slides or do as you wish. So just a couple of things. So again, hello, my name is Jose Aranda. I am one of the librarians here at uh, the Doniana Community College. Uh, I am stationed at East Mesa campus. If this is your first time uh, joining us, just know that we've been doing these for a couple of years now. Our website houses all our presentations and all supplementary resources that go with it. So I've talked about a lot of these things already in previous presentations, and I'm not including all those steps in this presentation, but if you're curious, we welcome you to uh, visit our page to check out all our previous presentations, but also contact us if you have any questions, uh, interests, if you need help finding them or you need suggestions on further resources. These are all meant for you, uh, our students and the public to, to view and use as you wish. Know that this one, I call it part one, which means there will be a part two. And actually, we can spend all semester talking about critical thinking. There's just so much information. If your intentions of joining this are not met, please let us know. We may have resources that cover something that, that wasn't and that interests you. So, but we just, we try to keep these presentations under 30 minutes. And this topic is just enormous. Sharpening your critical thinking skill. But let me begin that I am not, and I don't consider myself an expert, I do feel, uh, as an educator, very interested and passionate about critical thinking. I think it's very relevant and useful topic, but I don't claim to be an expert. I will show you a lot of the resources we've gotten our information and resources, of course, that we have, we have in the library. The objective of this presentation is to uh, inspire in our students some of the things we think are utmost important. That is the objective of today's presentation, is to introduce some of the key points that we feel are very important regarding critical things. So the objectives for today's presentations you see on the list here, okay, we're going to talk about what is critical thinking? We'll spend some time about bias and logic and analyzing arguments. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Like I said, there is so much that we could dive into. For those of you that are users of LinkedIn, I found this recently and I thought it was very interesting. For some of you, this may not be surprising. For others, it may. According to Sean Van Der Zeel from the National Association of Colleges and Employers, he said, critical thinking ranks number one in importance in terms of what employers are looking for in their applicants. So let me read exactly what he wrote. Recruiters consider critical thinking. Communication and teamwork be among the most important career readiness competencies that graduating college students can demonstrate. It's not just us. Here's an example of someone out there in an in industry that is also saying, uh, critical thinking is very important. So what is critical thinking? If you have an instructor that has an assignment, a unit, whatever on critical thinking, we are not trying to supplant what your instructor is trying to achieve in, in his or her class. We are trying here to define critical thinking in the most broadest sense, right? So some of your classes, some of your instructors may use critical thinking more narrowly in their class. So please uh, keep that in mind. According to Google, critical thinking is the objective analysis and evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. There are several key terms there in that sentence. We're talking about objective analysis. That is going to be repeated throughout this presentation. Objective analysis and evaluation, evidence, uh, resources, credibility, those all come into play in order to form a judgment. A lot of times students may think, or sometimes students may think that instructors don't really want to know about 
your opinions. And that's incorrect. Instructors, I bet, do want to know what your opinion is. But when we're talking about critical thinking, we're hoping in this presentation to uncover that there is somewhat of format for this. It's not just give me your opinion and then that's, it's more of a, an opinion based on some serious research and consideration of various factors and then at the end, you justify your opinion. So according to Google, that's, I thought, a pretty easy definition there, a pretty pretty good definition of critical thinking. The one below it is, is, is more detailed, of course. And this is from a website I found called the Foundation of Critical Thinking. And I'll provide all the resources at the end. They say the intellectually disciplined process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and or evaluating information gathered from or generated by observation, experience, reflection, reasoning, or communication as a guide to belief and action. Wow, that's a mouthful. A lot of key terms there, but I think it's kind of the same thing, right? You are coming to a conclusion based on thorough analysis of all the evidence. Those are just a couple of the definitions that I found. I'm sure you will find many, many more. And like I said already, if you're in a class and or an instructor is telling you differently, please follow your instructor's guidelines for that. And here's a resource that we recommend. It's more of a process, right? It's not just give me your opinion. It's a process. We feel that when it's taken seriously, that process can evolve. Opinions can change, you know? There may be facts uncovered that were not considered before. There may be surprise. There may be lots of things that can happen. So please keep in mind that it's a process and it's okay to change your mind. It's okay to be confused at times, to have questions. Just keep in mind, it's a process. So with processes, we want to treat them as part of engines that drive our desire to learn and eventually become independent thinkers, right? It's purposeful. It's reflective. You may hear that a lot today. What do you think? And why do you think that? And show me examples. So how do you go about deciding what you believe? So what are goals of critical thinking? This is the same authors, but a different resource from the previous slide. So some of the goals these authors mentioned, you know, is to accurately interpret evidence statements, graphics, questions, okay? It's not just accurately interpret. You know, going back to that objective, right? Trying to be as objective as we can. Identify the most important arguments, pro and con, address alternative points of view. You may hear us call it opposing viewpoints because we have a database, an awesome resource on that. And to draw warranted, judicious, non-fallacious conclusions. Those are big words, but in essence, it's to be as thorough and as, as credible of research we can in order to arrive at our conclusions that then we can explain and others can read and reason with us. Some of the goals, they're not Exclusive. These are just some of the goals you may consider when thinking about critical thinking. Probably the biggest obstacle to critical thinking, in my opinion, and, and others may share this, is this thing that we have called bias, right? And some of us may be better aware of our own biases than others, but it is a big thing. And if we are not aware of our biases, uh, they can really become obstacles in our pursuit of objectivity as best as we can get there. And so you may have instructors in their assignments and their instructions that they're trying to get you to think they've introduced resources or they suggested resources and hopefully a topic that is of interest to you. But we feel that it is important for students to learn about how to detect biases and what are biases? Well, here's a couple of definitions of biases, you know, preformed opinion about a subject that normally is subtle or accepted as normal after some time. It confirms what your views are, uh, ideas that are familiar, or, or things you like or dislike. We feel that it is important, first step, to know that we have them, these biases. There are ways to improve at limiting uh, some of the more obvious biases that can inhibit, like I said, our pursuit for that objectivity. That is our ultimate goal. We may not get there 100%, but we can get close, right? And, and I think a lot of instructors, they, that's what they want from their students. They want to hear your opinions, but they want to see your thinking, see your thinking. So it's a process, right? And conceptualizing it, compartmentalizing it, and being very explicit in explaining it is, is critical. It's critical to explaining why it is you feel that way, right? So it's important. 
to know about biases. How do you avoid them? Because we're all biased, right? Some of us are more biased than others. I think the thing most students need to learn here is how do I avoid, how do I work on that, right? Here are some suggestions from this source down here on avoiding bias. Use third person point of view. Choose your words carefully. Some words may be similar, but others may be more powerful in terms of explaining exactly what you're trying to say. Be specific when you're writing about people. Use first language, use gender neutral phrases, be inclusive or preferred pronouns and check for gender assumptions. This is not an exhaustive list. There are many more, I'm sure, but these are some that I think can help us to better understanding and avoiding biases. Biases can lead to manipulation, right? What's the difference? Bias is all over, right? You hear on the right-hand side, where, where are they? They're all over. And you've heard about fake news and the media and the right and the left and some all kinds of things. So there's bias inherently in all our media and sources that we use in our daily lives. It's really important to have conversations either with your instructor in terms of understanding better the assignment or with whomever you're having conversations with, colleagues, your peers, your family, your friends, whoever it is, your, your colleagues at work, that biases can lead to manipulation. And manipulation may be more obvious, right? Because you can see their intent, whereas biases can be subtle. But I want to pause here and open up a discussion. Maybe my colleague Susan can add a thing or two, or Therese, do you have anything to share? This is Susan. Welcome, everybody. One of the things that we had talked about when we talked about bias because a lot of people, that's a negative term. You know, they say, oh, you're just biased about whatever. And Jose were ha and I were having conversations just a little bit earlier this morning about it. You know, he said, well, you know, let's let's take a, a more neutral example. Because, you know, I mean, we can always talk about, you know, people have biases related to very touchy subjects like politics and religion and things like that. Well, a bias is sort of like a preference. You know, you prefer one team over another. You prefer chocolate or you don't prefer chocolate. In New Mexico, you red, green or Christmas. You know, those are preferences. The problem is, is that when your biases are either hidden are not shared with everybody, or then they go from being just personal biases to manipulation, where various ways that people are manipulated into thinking or believing something, then they're not having the whole picture. So the tools that Jose is going to be explaining are ways for you to be aware of biases, aware of when you might be manipulated by omission, by emphasis, by use of languages or in photographs or headlines and things like that. The idea of critical thinking is you could equate it to being awareness. You're aware of this because like Jose said, bias is not something that is can get rid of. It's always, it's a part of us as human beings, but being aware of it, some people are not. And when you are aware of it, you're more likely to think critically about what you're listening to, or talking about, hearing, uh, reading, things like that, watching. I guess my example would be, and it's related to by omission, it's by taking things out of context, you know, taking a tiny snippet out of a, an entire person's speech and making that more important than the, the whole of the speech, I guess, would be an example. But for sure, that's a type of omission. Yes, awareness is very important. So it's not that we want to eliminate bias. It's more, that, it's more so that we want to bring awareness to those so that as, as a student, as a writer, as a critical thinker, you know what they are and you can address them. And not only that, but you can be prepared, to defend them, or even more, consider the alternative view. And by doing all that, it strengthens your position. It demonstrates your willingness to go beyond your security circle or your bubble and, and address the, the alternative points of view or the opposing viewpoints or and that, by doing that, it, it, it is, is one way to become more objective, right? So it's not to eliminate, it's to be aware. And omission is a great example of that. This is a, a resource we subscribe at the library. Uh, many of our presentations before today have been on various resources we subscribe to. This one is called Brain Fuse. It is an online tutoring educational slash, it is a awesome resource, freely available to all our students and community users. 
from our websites. I've done a presentation on, on this that tells you how to use it and what all the, the details, bells and whistles of that resources are. In it, there is a critical thinking module, so to speak, right? Located under help. And so you, got, you have under there detecting bias, analyzing arguments, common logical flaws, etc. A lot of the things that I'm going to cover today briefly, but we wanted to bring to your attention that we have this awesome resource called BrainFuse that has a section called Skill Surfer that addresses critical thinking. And again, I did a search for more information about bias. And like I said, there, there's just a lot of information that we could have included in this presentation, but it would have gone on for hours, right? So instead of doing that, we just wanted to bring your attention to some of these resources we feel are worth your time checking out if you wanted to concentrate or focus more on bias. Lots of places there that have awesome resources that we recommend to learn more about bias. The next subtopic is the logical fallacy, otherwise known as a weak argument. That may be an issue in your assignments with your instructors. That may come up when you're writing or when you're presenting or whatever format it is that's taking place. We want students to know about arguments having credible, logical reasons that support it. And of course, one way to learn how to do that is to know what a bad one or a weak one or an illogical argument is. In essence, a fallacy is something that's not true, but is stated as such, right? Or it's misleading, it's deceptive, it's just false. And they're pushing that narrative. It's very important for students to be able to identify when they come across something like this and to be aware of this in their own writing as well. We want to make sure that our arguments follow logic, reasoning, and when we have erroneous reasonings, and I'll show you lots of examples of these, please bear with me. When you're aware of these, these can strengthen your argument because you are aware. Again, that's the key word is being aware. So does something make sense? Does something not make sense? But some of us have different levels of, of, de of determining that, right? Some of us never took philosophy. Some of us are not philosophers, you know, especially if it's in an area that is not our strength, you know, let's say like politics or literature, whatever area it is. I mean, we need to be cautious of weak arguments that uh, may lead to um, fallacies, right? So here are some examples. So as students who want to pretend you disagree with your conclusion, right? You know what your opinion is, but pretend you disagree. So what parts of the arguments now seem fishy? You know, what parts would seem easiest to attack? So this is advice. This is a suggestion for students or anyone writing uh, or presenting in this fashion to, to be aware, right? So these here are some tips. Pretend you disagree, list your main points, and then list the evidence you have for each of them. We feel this is a good one. That way you can see how your claims line up or align with the evidence. And then you have, of course, your thesis and then your conclusion. So alignment is very important. And that kind of helps us see how the reasoning or how the fallacy or how the argument is going, right? Uh, be aware that broad claims need more proof than when you say all Americans are whatever or all, you know what I mean? Those are, you need to be very, stay away from them. But if you must use them, you're going to need more proof than narrow. Because is that really true, right? So I'm sure some of you have heard something similar to this. But so they require more evidence. So when you're writing or when you're presenting an argument, keep that in mind that you want to have evidence that supports your claim. That can help uh, prevent some of these fallacies. And then double check your characterizations. I think this is very important. In recent times, you've seen probably in the media and elsewhere, people attacking people because they don't agree. And we feel that is just unjust. That is not right. We live in a free country where people should have the right to have different, different opinions. So argue, if you must, on the basis of the argument, on the topic, at the issue at hand. Don't personalize it. In essence, that's what this means. Don't personalize it. So it takes a level of maturity and perhaps even education to separate that, right? It's like person, I know this person, but we just don't agree. But it's on the level of that issue that we don't agree. It's not that I don't like that person or that person is a bad person. Keep that in mind, please. And there are many, many more examples of weak arguments. These are just some of the more popular ones we felt were relevant for students. Here are some examples. Hasty generalization. Hasty means you're, you're quick. You're quick to make that conclusion. So don't make assumptions about the whole group or the whole case and everyone's like this or, you know, 
all Republicans are, you know, all Democrats are, you know, no, beware of the hasty generalization. Missing the point. You're arguing and, and you're way off base. You're not even on the topic. You're, you're arguing over here. Your conclusion doesn't follow your argument or premise of the argument. That's what that means. False clause, post hoc. Two events that seem related in time, they're not really. Slippery slope claims that a short chain of reaction, usually ending in some dark consequence, will take place, but there's really not enough evidence for that assumption. A weak analogy is a weak argument. Things are being compared and they're really not alike. Apples and oranges. Appeal to authority using famous people or names or someone who really isn't an expert. And you see a lot of that on TV and commercials, I'm sure. Bandwagon also known as argue, arguer, try, tries to convince the audience to do or believe something because everyone else is doing it, right? That's what everyone's all about. Argument to the person, attacks the person, I mentioned that rather than the idea. Straw man sets up a weak version of an opponent's position and tries to score points by knocking them down. And then red herring. Partway through an argument, the arguer goes off on a tangent and raises a side issue that distracts the audience from what's really going on. There are many, 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 more examples, these are just some. Here's an example of hasty generalization. The premise of an argument does not support a conclusion. My roommate said her philosophy class was hard and the one I'm in is hard too. So that means all philosophy classes are hard, right? No, that's a hasty generalization. And there's a tip, you know, ask yourself, what kind of sample are you using? Are you relying on someone's opinion, experiences? If so, consider the, the evidence in that. You're missing the point. You're making an assumption about a whole group or a range of, of cases based on a sample. Stereotypes, you've heard of that. They're the most common example of, of missing the point. So the seriousness of a punishment should match the seriousness of the crime. Right now, the punishment for drunk driving may simply be a fine, but drunk driving is a very serious crime that can kill innocent people. So the death penalty should be the punishment for drunk driving. The argument actually supports several conclusions, right? The punishment for drunk driving should be serious in particular, but it does not support the claim that death penalty should be warned. There are some tips there on how to avoid missing the point. Again, this is being recorded, so don't worry if you're trying to write this down. We'll provide it for you. And the last example is the weak analogy. Many arguments rely on an analogy between two or more ideas or situations. If two things that are being compared aren't really alike in the relevant aspects, the analogy is then a weak one. And the argument that relies on it commits the fallacy of a weak analogy. Guns are like hammers. There's an example of a weak analogy. If you think about it, you can make an analogy of some kind between almost any two things in the world. My paper is like a mud puddle because they both get bigger when it rains. I work more when I'm stuck inside. And they're both kind of of murky. So the mere fact that you can draw an analogy between two things, it doesn't really prove it. So keep that in mind. And the tip here is identify what properties are important to the claim you're making. So taking good notes, as we always recommend when you're doing research and during the writing process, can help you avoid an, a weak analogy. How do you improve your arguments? Effect premises, okay, that are true and relevant. What's a premise? It's your opening statement, where you stand on the issue. Make sure your premise aligns with your conclusion. I've mentioned that already. Check that you have addressed all the important or relevant aspects of the issue and avoid making any claims you cannot support. Again, going back to BrainFuse, under Skill Surfer, it has a couple of things that I've already mentioned, analyzing an argument, and they can take you through some of the things we've already covered, common logical flaws, etc. But it also has quizzes there. So we invite you to check out BrainFuse. We can help you do that. And last but not least, cannot, as librarians, not tell you about what it is we have on our shelves or in our databases, right? So we have these ebooks we recommend for you if you're interested in learning or reading more about critical thinking. Here are ebooks, books you can access electronically from anywhere where you have internet access. These are the references we've used in this presentation and or have suggested for further research. The ones that have an asterisk are actual printed books we have in our collection for you to use. We have plenty of resources for you. We hope that today's presentation was useful. If you still need something other than what was covered, please let us know. We are here for you. We'd be more than happy to have conversations with you to help you find whatever it is you need in terms of resources, or even if it's more uh, in-depth with the critical thinking. 
Here's our contact information. Please reach out to us. We are here to help you. In summary, some of the things we've talked about is what is critical thinking? What is bias? How do you avoid that? What are logical flaws? How do you analyze arguments and how do you recognize and improve them? Our next presentation in this series is uh, in a couple of weeks on how to use Turn It In to write better papers. Please join us in a couple of weeks for that presentation. Again, our email is down there. Please send us an email to register for that or any other presentations we may have. The next slide is going to have the survey. Please take the survey. We are very interested in knowing how this presentation was for you, but also we want to know what you need from us. And that can help us better prepare and select our future presentations. Like I mentioned, I will be giving a part two but it's not until April. Depending on what information and feedback I get from you all will help us determine what I can include in that presentation. Like I said at the beginning, critical thinking is huge. It is so broad. There's so much in there. I mean, some of these books we've mentioned, they just have tons of stuff and it's good stuff. We're going to have to wait a couple months. It was our pleasure presenting for you today. Again, more information about our library and how to get a hold of us. Please take the time, click on and take, it's a quick three, four question survey. Again, we enjoy doing these presentations, but ultimately we want to be responsive to you, our users, our students, our community users. So let us know how it was and what you would like to see in the future. As Jose Aranda, the librarian here at DACC and my colleagues, Susan and Therese, it was our pleasure. Thank you very much. Hasta luego.